The Owl House has a surprising amount of depth the more you look into its society. That's actually generally a true statement for the Owl House in general. It has a lot more depth than its service level would imply, and the more you look at various aspects of it, the more it becomes clear that the story of the Owl House is as much a story of the society as it is the story of Luz, Ada, King, or any other character in the show. And the more that I look into the world of the Owl House, the more convinced I become of the following statement. The Boiling Isles is a fascist society. How can I make this claim? It seems like a fairly socially progressive place, there aren't any racial tensions, no open discrimination, no violence against minority groups. Not on the surface anyway. And the more that I talk to people about this perspective, the more I question how many people who watch this show are familiar with what fascism is exactly. See, when most people think of fascism, we tend to default to Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, or imperial Japan, when fascism was at its absolute most open height on the global stage. We think of soldiers in the streets, the armbands and the flags to get you in trouble if you show them on YouTube because this site is hell on earth. And we think of the authoritarian strongmen who rule over these societies with an iron fist. The issue there is that this isn't a great way to think of fascism. Because when that's your definition of fascism, then you're essentially waiting until fascists have won, taken power, installed their desired system onto a society, and that we have no way of fighting back against in any real way, or even before you can call them out. At which point they will track you down, put you in a van, drive you into the wilderness, and shoot you into a mass grave that they had you dig yourself. Fascism isn't when there are authoritarians, armies, and death camps. It's a bit more complicated than that. And none of those regimes just immediately become those hell states instantly. The image of fascism that we tend to have is one where the fascists have already installed their system totally and in literally every single corner of society and openly admit that they're fascists. But that isn't how it works anymore. There have been dozens of societies that have been fascistic since the end of the Second World War, but very few were as overt about it as the Axis powers ever were. You're not going to hear of a country describing itself as fascist, which is why you have to judge it based on its actions, policies, and rhetoric. Nations like Brazil, Turkey, and Poland, as well as nations like Belarus and Hungary, and not to mention Russia, all right now are being led by fascist-leaning governments, for example. And historically, many nations in the Americas had democratic elections interfered with to allow far-right, fascist-leaning dictators take power, so long as they were friendly towards the United States during the Cold War. Regimes like Pinochet in Chile, and the military junta in Argentina being two particularly noteworthy examples of this. But you don't tend to think of them when you think of fascism. That's because they were less blatant about it. To be able to identify a society as being fascist, we need to be able to identify what fascism is. And there are a number of definitions of fascism. And there is no one set definition. In fact, there are multiple different definitions. Even if you were to look on Wikipedia, it marks multiple different definitions on its page. And this is because... I'm not being hyperbolic here. Fascism is an inconsistent, contradictory, incoherent mess of an ideology that no one logics their way into because there are no logical reasons to be a fascist. Fascism is essentially what happens when you get material conditions to be awful enough and have enough people alienated from society that a bunch of young, sexually frustrated people who have nothing else going on in their lives start to clamour around any sense of identity and will usually rally around race and nationality. Two characteristics they have literally no control over, and take pride in those because that's all they've got. That is how fascism comes about, and what it is at the end of the day. As such, we can't really define fascism. What we have to do is look at a series of tenets that are present throughout various societies, and see which are applicable. Probably the most famous definition, and the one that I tend to use more than any other, is the Umberto Eco 14 points of fascism. So, what are those? There are 14 tenets that indicate fascistic ideology. These are combining multiple traditions, ignoring contradictory parts, and interpreting a primeval truth. Rejection of modernism and enlightenment thinking. Action for action's sake. Don't stop and think, just do. Disagreement is tantamount to treason. Stoking fear of difference. Preying on social frustration, often from the middle class. Obsession with plots and conspiracies. Characterizing enemies simultaneously as both weak and strong. Glorification of struggle, conflict, and war. Contempt for the weak. Cult of heroism, where death is honorable and rewarding. Machismo, where sex is power, but only for straight men. Selective populism, where the emotions of the small group 
are declared the will of the people. And Newspeak, changing language to undermine complex thought. So while I've done this before in my other videos regarding the broader political strokes that the Owl House engages in, I thought that this time I would go more in depth with the fascistic tendencies that the Isles displays and try to make a more compelling case for why I believe the Isles to be a fascist society. It's also worth noting that I've changed my mind on a few of the points since my last video on the Owl House, thanks to rewatching this show about seven times, and getting what I think is a far better look at the society that it takes place in. Number one, the cult of tradition. The cult of tradition essentially translates to, we don't need to explore new options or new ways of doing things, we've already figured them out through tradition. All we need to do now is further refine and find new ways to implement what we already know. This is reflected in the Boiling Isles through the Track and Coven system. For those of you who aren't aware, the Track and Coven systems are basically categories of magic that witches can be a part of. In school, they join a track system to learn the basics of that type of magic, and then when they graduate, they join a coven at which point a spell is cast on them, this allowing them from being able to perform other types of magic. Belos claims to be the only person who is capable of conveying the will of the titan, and claims that this is how magic is supposed to be done. Yet there is absolutely nothing whatsoever preventing witches from mixing magic, and many have done so with no negative side effects. Well, some have had negative side effects. Hello, detention track. But that's more to do with the fact that they're idiot children. Ida used all types of magic and was the strongest witch on the Isles until she lost her power. Yet this system is still maintained for literally no other reason other than tradition. The Titan seems to be an almost religious figure on the Isles too, and religious tradition is often utilised in fascist regimes. Appealing to religion is a tactic that many fascists will use. We already have all of the knowledge we need from all the authority we need. We don't need to go any further. Belos uses his apparent ability to speak to the Titan as justification for pretty much the entire way he structured the Isles to exist. So you might be asking, well if he's using religion as a tool to control society, doesn't that make the Isles a theocracy? Well sure, but the issue there is there isn't really much of a difference. Fascism requires you to persecute for the name of the nation or of the race. Theocracy requires you to persecute in the name of God. You serve both totally or you're a traitor. At that point, the only real difference is if you're calling the people you persecute subhuman or heretics. In addition, this point is the reason why, at the absolute least, even if the Boiling Isles isn't a fascist society, it is unquestioningly totalitarian. You cannot break this tradition, or you are arrested and, uh, quote, petrified. And I've mentioned this in my last video, this only serves Belos. If the people of the Isles decide that they've had enough of him and lead a revolution, this system already means that the magical capabilities of witches will be severely reduced but the Emperor's personal guard is not limited to this. They can use whatever type of magic their opponents use, and every other type to boot. So at best, we're dealing with Stalinism, and at worst, we're dealing with Nazism. What a fun variety of options that we have here. But yes, this is the cultural tradition, and I think it's quite clear that it applies to the Isles. Number two, the rejection of modernism. So it's important to understand what Enlightenment values are in order to understand this point. Essentially, the Enlightenment was an era of history between the 17th and 19th centuries, which was an intellectual movement that led the values and philosophies of which society is structured now. It questioned the monarchy's total control over society, religious hegemony, brought to the forefront ideas like democracy, the introduction of the scientific method, Enlightenment values inspired the Declaration of Independence. And of these values, the main economic ideology was free market capitalism. Basically a lot of the stuff that shaped how we ended up here today. Depending on your perspective, this can be a good or a bad thing. I'm a socialist, so I'm in favour of most of these values, I just don't think that they went far enough. Also not a fan of capitalism. If you're a fascist, these are ideals that you reject. Seeing them as building societies which foster weakness and idolise intellectualism. In regards to the Owl House, this point essentially begs the question, do the Boiling Isles have liberal values? Well, it does in some areas, and it doesn't in others. And why thank you, I do accept my award for the most worthless answer ever given by a human being. The Boiling Isles seems to be an absolute monarchy in which the Emperor has overall dictatorial control over policy on the Isles. And while he might delegate that to certain other institutions and individuals and let them run themselves as they see fit, he still has the final say and can undo their decisions in an instant. I assume... Let's be real, I don't exactly see Belos as the democratic type, and considering he's been described as a tyrant by people far more trustworthy than him, I'm pretty comfortable making the guess that he's a dictator. Yet somehow, the society is very liberal when it comes to social values. Equality of opportunity, for example, tolerance, 
acceptance, etc. These are all present in the Bonding Isles and are Enlightenment values. Additionally, capitalism also exists, apparently, which again came about through the Enlightenment and exists purely to taunt us that the Enlightenment didn't go far enough, thanks to capitalism's abysmal failure to fix the issues that the Enlightenment envisioned that it would. Oh, and also a fair number of the Enlightenment thinkers were fans of slavery. It's, it's a bit of a thematic tonal shift, if nothing else. But uh, yeah, that was a thing. The simple answer here is that you need to look into the Enlightenment for yourself, because it is super complicated. But the bottom line is that this point is a mixed bag in regard to fascism on the Isles. But it is worth noting, however, that even if the Isles does have Enlightenment values, fascism as we understand it only came into being after the Enlightenment itself as a rejection of those values. So bear that in mind. Number three, the court of action for action's sake. In the real world, this basically means a pointless show of force. Hello, USA-Mexico border wall, which is enormously expensive, ineffective, and hated by a majority of planet Earth, but makes mega maidens dream happy thoughts. You, you sure showed them immigrants. Essentially, this point boils down to one statement. Don't think. Do. For various reasons that I get into on the next point, intellectual thinking is discouraged in fascist societies, because to think is to essentially doom fascism. Shows of force which make no sense or aren't even negative to the general public interest are practiced in fascism, because everything has got to be a show to these regimes in order to keep the illusion that they're necessary going. One of the more interesting aspects of this in regards to Hexide and the track system, particularly in the episode The First Day, Bump encourages Luz to pick a track and then focus on it, and to not think too much about the fact that it makes literally no sense to be allowed to only take one track. He just tells her to focus. Don't question. Obey. Obedience is crucial to fascism. For all their talk of rugged individualism, MAGA-types, Republicans, Tories, and Conservatives in general all shut the hell up the second someone more powerful than them tells them to, because it is inherent to their ideology. Obedience. Do not think. Obey. And this is pretty clearly a part of the Isles, and it's only because of Luz that this is even being challenged at all. Number four, disagreement is treason. Fascism tends not to distinguish between the military and the civilian population. In the eyes of the fascist, everyone is a part of a never-ending struggle against a nebulous enemy, so it requires subservience to the state. To exist within a fascist society, you must submit yourself to the state and its laws in its entirety, and failure to do that is treasonous. A big part of the reason Ada spent the entirety of Season 1 as a wanted criminal is because she refused to join a coven. This is an affront to the system that the Emperor sets up throughout the Isles. This is treason. But so what? Who cares if someone disagrees with the state? It's not like questioning the state will do anything. The thing is, it does. I implore you, go and watch the YouTube of Vosh debate a Nazi. Go watch Xanderhal debate a fascist. Go watch Malfi Infidel, Jangles, Destiny, Dylan Burns, Rose Wrist, Demon Mama, any of these people who debate fascists and take note of what they do. All they have to do is ask questions and be slightly aggressive and the fascists always fall to pieces. There is not a single fascist on the face of the earth that can stand up to basic questioning because their ideology is so selective and contradictory that they fall apart when they have to actually answer questions relating to it. No one thinks their way into becoming a fascist, because fascism is a purely emotional response to material conditions. That's why they don't have policy, they have vague generalities about how we need an ethnostate. Or some other culture war... thing. This is the reason that disagreeing with the state is treason under fascism, and why fascists tend to hate intellectualism. Because all it takes is some mild questioning, and everything that their system relies on will fall apart. When people begin to question the state, the state is done for, and it can only respond with brutal crackdowns at that point, hence the Emperor making Ada a wanted criminal in spite of her doing literally nothing wrong. Even her criminal activities like theft and scamming after this point are more due to her being made a criminal due to not obeying the Coven system. I don't buy that she would have become a criminal even if the Covens weren't mandatory. In the context of the Owl House, this willingness to question the establishment, the way of things, and to question authority is akin to the fascist tendency to despise intellectualism. And that didn't even go into the fact that Bella still petrifies people who disagree with him and his rule, petrification as instance being a nice family-friendly way to say that he executes people. So yeah, disagreement is clearly treason on the Isles. 
Number five, the fear of difference. This is one of the points that since my last video, I've radically changed my perspective on. The last video I made on the Owl House, I said I didn't count this as a point. I now consider it to be not only a point, but to be one of the biggest signals of the Boiling Isles' fascistic nature. While there is a large degree of diversity within the Boiling Isles, from witches of various backgrounds and what to us would be recognised as ethnicities or racial groups, as well as demons and other various different what can only be described as species, all living alongside one another in what seems to be basic harmony. This isn't really reflective of there being no fear of difference. To them, this is completely normal. And not to get too in-depth about it, but this is also reflective on how the Boiling Isle sees race, which is to say it doesn't seem to see it. Which is vastly more scientifically accurate than what we have. The Boiling Isles tends to mark difference in three ways. The first one being that they despise human beings, apparently. To be completely honest, this isn't shown a lot, but it's apparently a thing that they do, but this point isn't all that important to this point. But it comes up later. The second difference is a difference in personality and social cohesion. In the first episode of The Outhouse, we're introduced to the Conformatorium, which is basically a giant prison for people who are deemed too weird to fit into society. These people just tend to have eccentric personality quirks, but aren't particularly harmful to anyone. Regardless though, they're treated with derision and are punished for this difference, which implies that there's a strict standard for behaviour employed throughout the Isles, and an inability to comply with it is paramount to treason, especially considering the people who don't conform to the Emperor's will are also sent here for petrification. Speaking of which, difference number three is opposing the Emperor, though we went over that in the previous point, so I think it kind of goes without saying. Fascists in our world tend to target people for characteristics that they cannot control. Like where a person is born, what language they speak, what religion they grew a part of, and using those differences to how unlike us they are. The Nazis did this to Jewish people, and in the modern West a lot of fascists do this to immigrants in general. In my country Britain we tend to do this to Muslims in particular. But they'll also target political differences too, Trump banging on about Antifa constantly being a pretty solid example. This is probably one of the most solid ways in which the Boiling Isles is a fascistic society. Number six, appeal to social frustration. In the real world, the middle class is an incredibly nebulous term that varies depending on the individual using it, but they're often targeted during either an economic crisis like we live in right now, or times of political humiliation. In these conditions, fascists can recruit people. To see this, we could take a look at Germany before the Nazis took over. You have a nation that lost World War I and felt weakened and humiliated by the victorious powers. The nation that left World War I, the Weimar Republic, was actually a fairly socially progressive place that underwent a massive cultural shift from conservative and traditionalist roles to a cultural renaissance known as the Golden Twenties. And it was a very progressive time in German history. To name just a few of the cultural shifts, several pro-LGBT films were released, different from the others in 1919, Medjian in uniform in 1931, the very first gender reassignment surgery was underwent in 1922, efforts were made to completely repeal an anti-gay legislation in 1929, progressive tax rates were implemented, and influences from other nations, particularly the United States, saw women branch out from what were strict gender roles in the German Empire, such as having short hair. Of course, throughout all of this, you have the conservatives, typically in the middle class, who decry all of this as un-German. Then you have an economic crisis in the form of the Great Depression, which led to rampant poverty. And now during this era, you see a rise of popularity in socialism and communism in Germany, as it had been there for a long time. Germany had the highest concentration of socialists in Europe around this time period. So around this time, they had become more and more politically active, and with the rise of the Soviet Union, the recently formed German middle class became more and more anxious over their power. Then the Nazis showed up, promised to get rid of all of these un-German cultural reforms, and to get rid of the communists, and this gets them a lot of popularity and power in the Reichstag. Enough to get enough seats in the Reichstag, and that gives them enough power to get Hitler appointed as Chancellor, and then the very bad things started happening. So, does this happen in the Boiling Isles? Not a sudden clue to be honest with you. We've not seen much evidence suggesting it as of yet, but, well, for reasons I'll get into in point 12, I don't think that it's super unlikely. Number 7, the obsession with a plot. Have you ever heard of the phrase cultural Marxism by any chance? No? How about Antifa are coming to your suburban houses? No? How about the Jewish question? 
there is one common thread between all of these, and that's that they are conspiracy theories designed to whip people into a protective frenzy. The obsession with a plot is usually oriented around the idea that there is some sort of plot to overthrow the established way of life of the people who live under a fascist state, and this is essential to fascism. The citizenry must feel like there is constantly an enemy ready to pounce, because if they are living in fear, then they are far more likely to support the state and its draconian action against the besiegers. Are the cultural Marxists, by which people mean mildly left-leaning people, coming to infest your schools and teach your children the poison of basic gender theory, even though that has nothing to do with Marxism. Doesn't matter. If you get people riled up into a frenzy, then when you take action against this imagined threat, the people will support you, O oh, glorious leader who watches out for their people. Is Antifa going to the suburbs? Who cares? People will support President Trump to keep the suburbs safe. Is there some grand conspiracy involving banks and Jewish people? What does that matter? Now the population is fully behind the war machine and the race, Herr Führer. In the 1980s, the Soviet Union saw an explosion of avant-garde and postmodern art. One of the people who emerged out of this scene was the theater director, Vladislav Surkov. Surkov worked as a PR man in the 90s for one of the Russian oligarchs, before switching over to work for Putin in 1999. His job was to use what he had learned from the arts to manipulate the public. He was in charge of PR for Putin's party, United Russia, but on top of that, he also used Kremlin money to fund and influence groups that were opposed to Putin. His goal was to infect the political discourse with a deliberate sense of absurdness and incoherence. He created his own oppositional youth group, which claimed to be anti-fascist, but then members would often compare themselves to the Hitler Youth, and were even allegedly used to beat up journalists. How do we know all this? because Surkov himself made it public knowledge. The result is that Russian politics has become a piece of absurdist theatre. As a Russian journalist put it, Surkov is at the centre of the show, sponsoring nationalist skinheads one moment, backing human rights groups the next. It's a strategy of power based on keeping any opposition there may be constantly confused, a ceaseless shape-shifting that is unstoppable because it is indefinable. Fascists will simply make up opponents in order to maintain an enemy for the population to be threatened by, all while simultaneously making up their own plots for whatever reason, usually conquest. The Day of Unity certainly sounds like a plot of some sort. 8. The enemy is both strong and weak. So, this reason more than any other is why fascism fails miserably, in my opinion. It's because it means that the fascists are basically incapable of accurately ascertaining the reality of the situation. In World War II, Hitler kept thinking that the threat of communism would wipe out his master race, and also that the Russians were backwater peasants that could be crushed by a massive invasion of the USSR, and, uh, to be reductive about it, that failed miserably. You see, it's pretty tricky to motivate a population with rhetoric like, there is a super powerful force out there that dedicates everything to killing all of us, and leaving it at that, because what's the point of fighting that? You have to simultaneously make the contradictory claim that in spite of that, they can be crushed easily. It's like listening to the entirety of Israeli politics. The Palestinians are a threat to our very existence, but it's okay, they live in shacks and huts and we have fucking tanks and can evict them in like 15 minutes. I can't help but feel you're not accurately assessing the situation here, lads. Mind you, at least there's some armed conflict going on there that at least makes the rhetoric make sense. Here in the West, fascists tend to believe in something called the Great Replacement, in which black people immigrating to white majority countries will make white people go extinct because black and white people will have kids and the kids will be fully white. Apparently they don't account for the fact that um, this would also mean there are less black people out there, but whatever, we'll roll with it. Apparently this is being done by black people and Jewish people, even though Jewish people aren't white according to these fascist types. But these people also believe that white people are superior in every way to non-white people, because that's it's also inherent to fascism. So we simultaneously have a situation here where white people are supposedly superior in a number of ways, one of which they will claim is intelligence to non-white people, but the non-white people keep outsmarting us in this grand game of demographic chess we're apparently all playing. If what I just described to you sounds completely sodding insane, that's because it is, but I swear to God that people believe this. Sean did a good video on this. 
that highlighted its contradictory insanity. Uh, so the stats that were just showed there come from the Migration Observatory from the University of Oxford, and Lauren cites two sources from the Migration Observatory. Let's take a look at those. Uh, the first is long-term international migration flows to and from the UK, and for a start, this one says, the share of EU citizens in LTIM inflows and net flows has increased. The share of EU citizens among incoming migrants has been steadily increasing since 2004, when it stood at 22%, and is much higher than the average for the 2000-2003 period, when it stood at about 13%. By contrast, the share of immigrants from outside the EU has declined from 63% of all incoming migrants in 2004 to 45% in 2016. So according to this study, migrants from outside the EU account for less than half of the total incoming migrants. Now, I know you're Canadian, Lauren, maybe you don't know that much about Europe, so a little geography lesson for you. India, Pakistan, and Africa aren't in Europe. It's not even close. And if we take a look at the other migration observatory source, Migrants in the UK, an overview, that one actually lists the countries that migrants into the UK come from. And the number one spot is Poland. Poland tops the tables for both country of birth and country of citizenship among migrants in the UK. And take a look at these countries. The vast majority of countries on this list are within Europe. These are mainly European migrants coming into the UK. These populations are primarily of Indian, Pakistani, or African background is just a flat out lie. Why is Lauren ignoring the Polish immigrants, for instance? I wonder why that could possibly be. So is this applicable to the Owl House in any way? Well, to be honest, that's kind of hard to say. We don't really know if there is a threat that the Emperor preaches to his subjects. Humans, maybe. But humans are a faraway threat, and we don't even know if he plans to attack them or not. Maybe wild witches? He kind of flopped on Edo, being a number one priority, and when she escaped confinement in the final episode, and he just kind of went, eh, it'll be fine, essentially, so I don't know, to be honest. Number 9. Pacifism is trafficking with the enemy. Now, this one can be put down to speculation, based on what we've seen within Season 1. Fascism essentially issues you an ultimatum. If you aren't fighting for the good of the race of the nation, then you are fighting against it. This is because, if you remember, fascism is obsessed with the idea that someone is plotting to hunt them all down. If you're a pacifist in this conflict, then you're allowing this to happen, and also disagreement with the straightest treason, so... Yeah, it naturally follows. We've seen very little of this that I could directly call out on, except for maybe when the Emperor realised Lilith was working against him. But even then, that one is seriously debatable, because Lilith did legitimately work against him. So I can't really give this one a definitive mark in this regard, but I can speculate. And my speculation is thus. Considering the fact that the Boiling Isle seems to be an absolute monarchy, unless you think that somehow this society that doesn't have a shown parliament building for some reason has a deep value towards a democratic process, would anyone really be surprised if, in the event that the Emperor demanded everyone turn against Lus, Ada, and King, and some of them refused, that the Emperor would declare them traitors? Really, we've got secret executions, the enforcement of tradition by law, people being gulagged for being slightly weird, this agreement is treason, and now, spoilers for the few remaining point, building a society with elitist ideas, building a death cult, giving his coven some suggestive ideas about weapons, and deciding the will of the people and the titan by himself, and we think he's willing to draw the line at calling pacifists traitors. That's the bridge too far, do we think? Admittedly, I can't empirically prove that right now based on what we have seen of Belos, but I'm not going to put much money in him respecting your right to be a conscientious objector, is my point. Number 10. Contempt for the weak. This is probably one of the absolute easiest ones to mark down as a tenant of fascism on the Isles. Weakness seems to be treated with utter contempt. Firstly, we can just look at their prejudice towards humans. The majority of their prejudice doesn't seem to be based on, I don't know, the fact that they have round ears, and round ears are weird. That would be absurd, none of them care about that. No, their contempt for humans is that they are seen as inferior beings. Why are they seen in this way? Because humans cannot do magic. This is the crux of a lot of the anti-human sentiment on the Isles, and seems to be a metric that is used very frequently. And while we could normally crock this one down to racial hatred, Another instance within the series proves that this isn't the case, and that's how Willow was treated. Because she was placed on the Abomination track by her parents even though she had no skill or interest in Abomination magic. Fantastic parenting, by the way. She is perceived as being very weak and unskilled, and is ridiculed heavily for it, despite the fact that she is actually a very skilled and powerful witch when it comes to plant magic. This also ties back into her and Amity's friendship, where Amity was disallowed from being friends with Willow by her parents due to Willow's magic not developing until later on in life. This is social Darwinism. The strong rise to the top and the weak stay at the bottom and should know their place. These two should not interact, it goes against the nature of things. So the theory states. If the weak and strong intermix, the strong will become weaker for it. It is a perversion of nature, it isn't proper. 
And this is crucial to fascist ideology, which tends to exhale a nation and a particular racial group above all others. Fascism, by nature, must be elitist. Weakness on the Isle seems to be held in contempt. That's the basis for the hatred of humans, and the basis on which Amity's parents forbade her for being friends with Willow. Failure to be strong means that you can't join the Emperor's Coven, and that means that you don't get the divine privilege of using all types of magic. At every turn, systemically, the weak are hounded here. We can also look at the Emperor's rule over the Isles to prove this. The Emperor's openly praised for being the strongest witch alive. And that's... kind of used as his only justification for being the Emperor? Like, legitimately. He claims that he can talk to the Titan, but this isn't proven as of yet, and even if it was, it means literally nothing other than the implied religiosity that it suggested he is responsible for in the first place. So that just leaves his power. And considering the implication that he just took over by force, this leaves us with nothing but the conclusion that this is how society is ruled. The strong on top and the weak subservient. His society holds utter contempt for the weak. Number 11. Everyone is educated to become a hero. It's a lot easier to maintain power and to get people to fight in battles that no sane person would go into when you've developed an entire society based around being a hero. The idea of dying in glorious battle for the mother or fatherland, of becoming a martyr to the cause. Fascism is a death cult, wherein people are conditioned to become as fanatical as possible so as to fight to the last man. Has anyone ever seen the old World War II footage of the German army fighting in the ruins of Berlin and even in the Reichstag, apparently somehow thinking that they still had a chance against the absolute onslaught of the Soviet army? Or the Japanese Banzai charges because to the Imperial Japanese soldiers, death was preferable to the dishonour of being taken alive? This is the cult of death, and this is what it means to be educated to become a hero. Can someone explain to me what this is if not the Emperor's Coven? Obviously this is a kids show, we're not going to have them doing any suicide charges, but the Emperor's Coven is a heavily propagandized elite branch, answerable only to the Emperor himself, which acts as the enforcer of his apparently divine will, is a socially respected position, is allowed to use all types of magic, and everyone is encouraged to pursue the Emperor's Coven as a position to aspire towards. To be in this coven is to say you are the best of the best, you are a hero of the Isles. This also goes into the glorification of the state, wherein you are naturally virtuous if you serve the state in a service capacity. If you glorify the armed forces, you'll never have a shortage of volunteers, and in the same vein, the Emperor will never have a shortage of people who are willing to fight to enforce his will. Number 12. Machismo and Weaponry Now this is another one that I changed my mind on since the last video I did in the Owl House. It's half correct and half incorrect. I still stand by the things that I said in my previous video, that there doesn't seem to be a strong hatred of women or LGBT people in literally any respect whatsoever in the Isles. I would point out that Lilith is a woman who was in charge of the Emperor's Coven, and that Amity's crush on Luz is treated no differently to a heterosexual crush, and that in multiple displays of Boiling Isles history, LGBT relationships are portrayed alongside heterosexual relationships as being nothing unusual, to the point that I don't think the Isles even has a concept of LGBT other than as a preferential indicator. In these senses, this point is inapplicable. However, upon rereading the original essay where Umberto Eco wrote down these points, he wrote this. Since even sex is a difficult game to play, the Ur-Fascist hero tends to play with weapons. Doing so becomes an ersatz phallic exercise. Comrade Echo calling out all the weird sexual LARPing fascies here, I see. Essentially what he means here is that in order to compensate for sexual inadequacy or insecurity or whatever you want to call it, fascists will tend to surround themselves with weapons to make themselves seem more masculine and dangerous than they actually are. Like how those right-wing militias went to Black Lives Matter protests armed with assault rifles, wishing someone would try to stop them, and then when someone does, every single time the militiamen scream victimhood and run off. Like the little words that they are. It's essentially that. What is that if not the Emperor's Coven's freedom to utilize whatever types of magic they desire? Think about it. The Emperor's Coven are the only group permitted to mix magic, that is an absolutely ideal scenario for someone insecure in themselves to feel a sense of power in their lives. Christ, depending on how in-depth you want to look into her character, you could even ascribe this motivation to Amity's desire to join the Coven, if we account for how absolutely screwed up her family life seems to be. The ability to project power in that way, to display military might, to grasp at that feeling of power and masculinity, that is an aspect of fascism and fascist aesthetics, 
that is integral to these types of movements. Remember that fascists prey on feelings of political humiliation and unease, and then they try to implement this sort of machismo. The feeling of empowerment is where a lot of people fall into these ideologies. It also tends to get weirdly sexual to a lot of these fascist types. If you ever go on 4chan, you'll find a lot of odd people who talk about a civil war like they're ready to, um... Do things that would get me TOS off YouTube. Like I said, these people are deranged. And while there was no explicit anti-LGBT stuff in the Owl House, what there is is a lot of anti-human sentiments. And would you look at that? The confirmed lesbian has a crush on a human and her parents have previously been shown to despise weakness and humans are seen as inferior weak creatures. I wonder if we're going to have some allegorical homophobia going on here. Number 13. Selective Populism. I'm still amazed with how accurate this one ended up being. Essentially, what is being said here is that fascists tend to claim to be the voice of the people, but in reality they only usually refer to themselves or their corporate backers. It's the silent majority thing that you'll hear Republicans talk about a lot. That they are the true representatives of the will of the people, democratic results be damned. It happens a lot on sites like YouTube too, you'll get a vocal group of people who cry about SJWs or whatever, and you'll have people like Sargon of Akkad, I Hypocrite, and Tim Pool, and they'll go on about how these few groups are proof that the entirety of YouTube has had enough of the left, when in reality it'll be about seven people in a sea of YouTube that doesn't give a crap about this because they're busy playing video game playthroughs and watching cat videos. Considering the fact that Bella seems to be literally the only person who can speak to the Titan, or so he claims, like I mentioned previously, I feel this one is pretty obvious. I mentioned in my last video that Willow's display of getting people to oppose Ada's execution was a symbol of this too, since Bellows backed off the petrification when it saved him face. And it is true. Fascists tend to back off a lot of unpopular policies, at least in public. When they're in power though, when there's nothing to stop them, they'll just do whatever the hell they want. Point 14. Ur fascism speaks in newspeak. This is probably the weakest point that I've got within the Isles, at least as of right now, but I can point to one very good example of this. And that being the reference of all time periods before the arrival of Belos as the Savage Ages. That really does simplify things, doesn't it? That there were no other complexities at all at play there? That society before Belos was a savage, brutal system and that's the end of it? Spoken, just like, by the way, the Europeans before they wiped out the Native American tribes during the colonial era. That's a nice little way of framing the way the world worked before the arrival of our god King Belos. Very simple, not at all complex. Stop thinking about it. As for a real world example, I don't know, just watch Trump's scream of fake news every 16 seconds and I'll catch you up to speed. There were other points that I could get into and other definitions, and aspects in which I think Umberto Eco's definition falls short. Fascism often works with the rich and capitalist classes in order to fund and maintain its war machine, because capitalism can exist under fascism, but it cannot under socialism. Emilio Gentile wrote that fascism tends towards the aestheticization of politics, be that through performance or through actual aesthetics, both of which are absolutely at play in the Boiling Isles, from the witch doctor aesthetic of the emperor and his coven, to his playing of the role of a humble middleman messenger from the titan with his population, when his plans to petrify Eda fall through, there are a number of other definitions that can be used. But here's the kicker here. You don't need every single one of these traits to be present in a society for it to be fascist. If you have multiple, then you need to start being concerned. After reviewing Owl House, the Bonnet Isles fits into most of these definitions. A lot of them are observations that you can only really make if you look into the history of previous movements, the various definitions of fascism that exist, and when you really look at the way the Boiling Isles is structured. And while the Boiling Isles is socially progressive, that doesn't make it a good society to live in. What we have here is a society which is doomed to collapse, because that's the common trend of fascism. It is a system of governance which is self-defeating. Fascism must constantly play a show must constantly keep people angry at a new opponent, must constantly remind you of the enemy. Because without those things to maintain it, people start to ask questions. What does this serve? Why do we live like this? What is the threat here that we need to be protected from, that this oppression is just? Despite the myths of a brutally efficient government, the Nazi, Japanese and Italian governments during the height of their regimes were absolute bureaucratic, inefficient, drawn out, ineffective, infighting hell states 
that were universally bad at running their societies. I encourage you to look at these societies if you're looking to learn about both the dangers of them and also if you want a good laugh at how badly they were run. If you're interested in World War II in particular, I would recommend the channel World War II, which does a week-by-week -week playthrough of the Second World War with specials focusing on specific incidents. The Boiling Isles isn't a good society. It oppresses people and dictates their lives, and they are indoctrinated into service of the state, and are without question run ineffectively, and this system is doomed to collapse. It's just a matter of how many people get hurt or die before then, which is why I am a vitriolic anti-fascist. I said you don't need to have all these tenants to be a fascist society. Umberto Eco was a lot less lenient than that. He argued that you only needed one or two of these for fascism to take hold of your society. So I'll encourage you all to do this. Look at your country. Notice all of these things in your government. And then find me one nation where none of these apply. And then, when you realise there isn't one country on earth that doesn't have at least a few of them, the question becomes, why is this the way things are? And how can we stop fascism from being so prevalent? Well, I've run out of time to explain that here, but I will link some videos in the description that talk about the links between the modern day state of being and of fascism. And I will be answering this in another video I'll be making on the Owl House about how Ada Clawthorne is an anarchist. So if you're interested in that, subscribe to my channel for more content from me, as well as liking and commenting and ringing the bell because YouTube is about as efficiently run as British Railways. The engagement helps me out in YouTube's algorithm and helps more people see this video and I really appreciate it. Show it around as well if you like. I would love to see more people having more discussions about how the Owl House is based in a fascist society because it feels like a lot of people in the Owl House fandom are very unaware of just how messed up this society is. I'll thank all of you for watching, and I'll see you when whatever comes next. See ya.